Housing First has five key principles. Principle number two, consumer choice and self-determination. This principle highlights that participants want and can make productive change occur in their lives. But in order to thrive, meaningful housing options are a necessity and research shows that a majority of participants prefer independent market housing throughout the city. Now, in order to foster learning and self-determination, it's important that the team support most choices participants make. Though the team can point out expectations, they should avoid overprotecting participants from learning opportunities. When choices have poor outcomes, a supported learning environment promotes more informed choices in the future, reducing long-term harm and increasing self-sustainability. We're always making choices and we're making the right choices and the wrong choices and we're learning from choices, but it's so fundamental to the human condition and learning how to better navigate your life that somehow, because it's so ubiquitous, we sort of take it for granted. And, and what that means for people with psychiatric disabilities in the mental health system typically, we forget that they have not really had a choice about most of this for most of their lives. And yet we're expecting that they're going to be independent living in the community at some point if we keep telling them what to do. It doesn't work that way. You know, we really start from the beginning. They're making the choice, they're making the right decisions or the wrong decisions, but they're learning from it and where they're supporting it. It's absolutely fundamental to the whole program. It was hard to trust the situation too. It's like, what do you mean? You're just gonna offer me to look at all these apartments and put me in one? I have a hard time trusting the situation after spending a year on the street and, and not being in shelters and not doing any of those things. So uh, establishing trust with organizations is something too that takes a little bit of time. Having a choice in where I lived was huge. Uh, there's. You know, you, you have no choice when you live on the streets. Your, your shelters, your, there's some of them that you can abide by the rules. You get kind of railroaded into staying the same places. They tell you when to wake up. They tell you when you go to bed. They tell you what time you eat. They tell you what you eat. Um, so to be given the choice to actually go and shop around for homes too gave me a sense of normality that I haven't had in a long time. When it comes to consumer choice, that flips the whole thing on its head and acknowledges people's autonomy. But it also acknowledges that people have the right to choose their own, their own life and how they want to live their own life. I think that it's not about scattered sight versus single sight, but rather if we are really going to have meaningful choices for people in their housing, it's about having both, right? And having, and not just, you know, one model of each either, right? Like a lot of different options that support, you know, different aspects of people's identities or different therapeutic environments. Um, and that, that, you know, as Jeff was saying, it should be really tailored around people's individual goals, so. People don't do well when they aren't given choice and dignity and respect. And so there's risks, there's harm. As a nurse, harm reduction is a huge piece. And, um, you know, we live harm reduction as nurses. And there's, it reduces harm to house people in a place of their choosing. You know, if we think about this as really being like what we really want to do is give people more than a choice of what part of the town you want to live in or what kind of housing you want to have. Um, but a question about, do you really feel like you're the person that gets to make the decisions for your life? For me, there was a lot of sidebar conversation with the peers on our team. They'd find a moment and they'd come and sit with me in the team lead office and say, you know, about some of the things that you shared in, in the treatment planning meeting, you know, where, where did that come from? And they'd really challenge some of those things and I realized that every time I made an assumption <laughs> that I was actually taking choice away from everyone. Really for me, it was every time that I, I made an assumption, I came across an assumption, I either took pause and asked myself or asked you know, people that, that were around me that, whose plan was this? There was this individual who um, was previously living in an SRO and um, the staff there said that it would be impossible for him to live independently and kind of told us that we were taking a very, very large risk. He was punching out windows on a weekly basis, um, not really compliant, not on any medication, not on anything like that. And we looked at 17 apartments. <laughs> and he actually finally found one and we he got it and it was a huge celebration and 
he moved in there and he's so happy and he's now identifying things on his own of what he wants to work on and he shows up to appointments being this is what I need to do today and this is what I want to do and he's such a strong advocate and he's so lovely and charming to be around and he's yeah and when you actually are able to do that and sometimes you kind of feel like turning around being like ha you know like look at him now and <laughs> but, it's, um, but you can't do that <laughs> it feels like sometimes there's a difference between what we frame as choice and what actually is choice say well you can deal with whatever you want to but we only have the resources to do these two things and we can look into that other thing but it'll probably be a bunch of months and we can't really do anything about it so maybe we should move on to something more realistic and actually having a full suite of services to provide real choice felt like it was something different and really worthwhile. When we don't actually have like real full choice, if people don't actually have autonomy in their life, we're actually enacting paternalism because we don't actually trust people with their choices. So, you know, autonomy is where we trust people with their own lives. And I know that that's something that we really struggle with as workers to, you know, how do we get ourselves out of the way and our systems out of the way so that we can trust a person with their own life. That's the only way that we can really be enacting autonomy. You know, if we're aligned with what they want, you know, where they want to go in their life, then we're not dealing with someone who's resisting us. Working with this model also means that we don't burn out as workers because we're not working against people, we're working alongside them. That old social work model with the boundaries where we had to be way back here and we had to be really careful of not getting too close or being too connected. Now we know that um, the danger isn't being too connected. The danger is being too disconnected. People are going to exercise their autonomy. They're just going to do it, right? So we have to decide what to do with that. Like, are we going to try to suppress it? Are we going to try to like use verbal violence or structural violence to inhibit their autonomy? We're always kind of moving through these polarities of um, taking some really oppressive actions and then trying to check ourselves and recognize how do we come back to that, that principle of self-determination. So I don't think we do it perfectly and I think um, inherent to the system that we operate in um, are that we have to hold these contradictions within ourselves but be skillful enough to recognize um, when we are actually taking away someone's ability to make choice for themselves. So it's not just about a bunch of choices, but it's actually about like a, like a way bigger project, right? About really making room for dignifying a person. Um, that, I think, is something we're, we're just on the edge of. I think that alone is really the most powerful thing about Housing First, is just respecting choice. And through that, I have learned more and I think achieved more in my work doing that than, than I ever did coming in as, you know, educated expert here to tell you what's wrong with your life. And that's the beauty of Housing First. <laughs>